question of, are there really pearly gates and streets of gold in heaven? Uh, Answer, yes. According to this passage, according to Revelation chapter 21 this morning, yes, there are pearly gates and streets of gold. If you don't believe me, skip ahead to verse 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 21 says, the 12 gates were of 12 pearls. In fact, each uh, individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. So there you have it. In heaven, there really are pearly gates and streets of gold, just like we hear about in all those stupid jokes, right? Like this one. uh, Maybe you heard about the guy who was near death, and, 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 and yet as he was about to die, you know, this was a guy who, who worked really hard for all that he had, and, and he wasn't excited about the idea that he was going to have to leave it all behind when he died and went to heaven. And so he prayed, and he asked God if he might be the one exception to the rule, and if he might be allowed to just bring one suitcase with him into heaven. And believe it or not, God actually went along with it. God accepted it. And so this guy died, he, 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 he shows up at the pearly gates, and, and right before he died, he packed a suitcase filled with solid gold bars, solid gold bars. So he shows up at the pearly gates, Peter greets him, and he says, hey, welcome to heaven. Now, I already know about your previous arrangement, you know, that, that you're allowed to bring one suitcase with you, but you know, I, I got to ask you, I mean, just out of curiosity, what's in that suitcase anyway? I mean, you know, can I take a look at it? So the guy opens it up, he shows it to Peter, and then, and then he walks in, and, and afterwards, the angel Gabriel turns to Peter and he says, you know, what was in that guy's suitcase anyway? He says, you know, it's the strangest thing, because, you know, this guy went through all that trouble just to come up with a suitcase filled with asphalt, because, uh, you know, <laughs> the streets of heaven are paved with gold. Yeah, that's a stupid joke. Uh, but it's true, there really are streets of gold and pearly gates in heaven. Now, let's keep in mind where we are in the book of Revelation. So far in the book of Revelation, we've seen that the rapture of the church has already taken place. We saw that back in Revelation chapter 4. And then after that, then we looked at the seven-year tribulation period as God's wrath was poured out upon the earth, the, the earth that rejected him and refused to believe in him, that is. And then we saw that that was finished as Jesus now in Revelation chapter 19 returns from heaven to planet earth with his bride, by the way, after what was called the marriage supper of the lamb, he and the bride come back from heaven to planet earth in chapter 19, and then he sets up his kingdom on planet earth where he rules and reigns literally for 1,000 years, Revelation chapter 20. And now that brings us to the last two chapters of the book. And in these last two chapters, we have now a description of heaven, a description of eternity, and it's a very detailed description. I mean, we're given measurements and we're given all these details reminding us that heaven is a real place, or as Johnny Erickson Tata in one of her books calls it, heaven is our real home. And so now we're going to look at our real home. We're going to look at this real place called heaven as we now pick it up where we left off, verse 9. And as we look at verse 9, we are now looking at the wonder of heaven, the wonder of heaven. Verse 9 now says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And so now we are looking at the wonder of heaven. In fact, it's been said that there's actually three wonders in heaven, three wonders in heaven. Number one, the first wonder of heaven, when you get there, is who is there? Who's there? Because, you know, when you get to heaven, you might discover that there's some people in heaven that you never thought would make it to heaven, and yet they are there. That's the first wonder. The second wonder of heaven, however, is who's not there? Because, you know, there might be some people that you thought would make it to heaven. You, 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 you thought they would get there, and yet you're surprised to find out they didn't make it to heaven. 
And so the first wonder is who's there. The second wonder is who's not there. But the third and most glorious wonder of them all is that you're there. (laughs) Now, as true as that may be, listen to this. No, the greatest wonder of heaven, the most glorious wonder of heaven is, is God himself, the glory of God. As it says in verse 11, this city is having the glory of God. It says that her light was like a most precious stone, a jasper stone, clear in appearance, crystal clear. And so that's the glory of heaven. So John now is describing what he sees. It's as if he sees this this heavenly city that's illuminated by the very glory of God itself. And so it's shining with, with vibrant greens and, and sky blues and, and crimson reds and, 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 and glimmering gold and, and deep violets. And in fact, the, the gold is so pure in heaven, it's actually translucent. It, it, it's crystal clear, it says. So now over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be identifying some, some key principles when we look at heaven. And so number one, we're going to be talking about the sights of this heavenly city the sights of this heavenly city. And listen, first of all, we see that that there's no need for the sun or or for the moon or for the stars in heaven because this heavenly city is going to be shining because of the very glory of God. We see that not only in verse 11, but later on we see it also in verse 23, that the glory of God radiates and that's what illuminates this city. As, As Dwight Moody put it, he said, it's not the jeweled walls it's the, or the pearly gates that make heaven so attractive. No, it's being with God. Listen, yes, there are streets of gold. Yes, there, there, there are jeweled walls and, and jasper and, 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 and sardius and emeralds and all these wonderful things, but none of that it compares to the main attraction of heaven, right? God himself, the glory of God. Listen to this. In heaven, we will be with God. In fact, we will see him face to face in heaven. Now, think about that for just a minute. The Bible tells us that no mere mortal man has ever seen the face of God and yet stayed alive to tell about it, can see the face of God without dying. And yet the Bible tells us we will see him face to face. Revelation 22 verse 4 says that we shall see his face and his name will be on our foreheads. You know, it's just like what Jesus said in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So this now is what John is describing for us in Revelation chapter 21. And this morning, we're going to see that that heaven is not just a, a, a metaphorical concept, but no, it is a real place. It's a real place for real people who do real things in heaven. In fact, this is the very real place that even Abraham was searching for. We read about this in Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. It says in Hebrews 11 that it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. And he went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land that God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Verse 10, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. He was looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. In other words, this is telling us that what Abraham was looking for in his heart of hearts, he wasn't going to find here on this earth. He wasn't going to find it in this world because the truth is that this world was not his real home. No, his real home was eternal, built in the heavens, built by God. And and listen to this, deep, deep down inside of all of us, the same thing is true for us. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. He's placed eternity in our hearts. Or as one writer put it, he has put a heavenly homing device in the heart of every single person on the planet. A desire for something more, a desire for something else, a real heavenly home. And so deep down, that's what we're all longing for, 
a home that was built in eternity, whose foundations were built by God. And this is what John is describing for us in Revelation 21. In fact, over the next couple of chapters, John, as he describes this, he he uses the word city 11 different times to speak of heaven, reminding us again that that heaven is a real place. And here's what we need to know. We need to know that, that, yes, heaven has been prepared for us, but listen, we are also being prepared for heaven. Let me say that again. Heaven is, is being prepared for us, but we are being prepared for heaven. Listen, we need to know that that what we are going through in this life actually is preparing us for the future. And yeah, that means that, that yeah, there's some things that we go through, uh, some some circumstances that we face that, yes, they they prepare us for future opportunities and, and future ministries here on this earth, but ultimately, the things that we go through are preparing us for eternity. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for the eternal weight of glory that's beyond all comparison. What we're going through now is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. It's preparing us for our real home. And this is what John is describing for us. And so first he starts by describing the wonder of heaven, the glory of God itself that radiates and illuminates this whole place. And now with that, he actually now goes on to describe and give us a physical description as he now describes the walls and the the foundations of heaven as we now pick it up in verse 12. And also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and, and 12 angels at the gates, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So now John describes this, this, these, this wall with 12 gates and 12 foundations. Now, of course, we read this and we read about the gates, but listen, these gates are not designed in heaven to keep us in because we'll read a little bit later on in verse 24 uh, through 26 that these gates were never closed. The gates in heaven are always open. You know, when you think about it, you know, walls are are usually built and and usually erected to keep people out, right? You know, kind of like the Great Wall of China, for example. Or on the other hand, sometimes walls are put up to keep people in, you know, like the Berlin Wall that divided, you know, East and West Germany, for example. But neither is the case with the walls of heaven. You see, the the walls of heaven neither keep people in, nor do they keep people out, because as we mentioned, the gates never close. The gates are always open. And so these walls in heaven are more like a, a, a monumental wall, a memorial wall. You know, much like, uh, like the Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C., which bears the name of some 58,272 brave men and women who were killed in action during the Vietnam War. A memorial wall. And in the same way, this wall in heaven is a memorial wall. And in the same way, we see that the, the gates and the pillars are engraved with names in memorial. We see on these, on these gates are the, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, and on the foundations are are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, the 12 apostles of Jesus. Of course, you know, we wonder who who was the 12th apostle, right? Because, you know, obviously Judas, you know, didn't make the cut, right? I mean, he blew it. He, He betrayed Jesus, right? And so, you know, who's the 12th apostle? Well, maybe it's Matthias, you know, because in, in, in Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 26, we read about how Peter and the rest of the disciples tried to choose a replacement for Judas. You know, and effectively, basically, they chose uh, Judas's replacement by basically doing rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> you know, just like Sean Moreno and, and Monte Ball trying to figure out who's going to score the next touchdown. Rock, paper, scissors. It's, you know, they, they, it says that they drew lots to figure out who was going to be the replacement. And then the lot fell to, to Matthias. And so basically, Matthias was chosen by committee. Now, hey, listen, uh, committees don't always do a great job, do they? I mean, sometimes they do, but not always. In fact, it's been well said that a, that a camel was really just a horse that was put together by a committee. 
Now, we don't, know, we don't know who Matthias is. The scripture doesn't say much about him, but I'm sure he was a good man. I'm sure he was a godly man. I mean, otherwise, he, he wouldn't have been up for, for consideration. Well, listen, and, and this is just my personal opinion, but, but listen, I don't really think that he was God's choice for the job. The reason I say that is because a little later on, we read about Saul of Tarsus in the book of Acts. And how, you know, Saul of Tarsus at the time was an enemy of the church, but then later on, he becomes a Christian. And later on, his life is transformed. He goes on to become the Apostle Paul, who, who, who becomes not only uh, the, a church planner, but he is transformed from the greatest threat that the early church had ever seen to now the greatest apostle and church planter the early church had ever seen. And not only that, but he, he actually writes one-third of the New Testament. Now, as far as Matthias is concerned, I mean, we, we never hear of him again. He's mentioned once in Acts chapter 1, and that's it. But the Apostle Paul goes on to write a third of the New Testament. And so it's just my opinion, but I happen to think that when we get there, we're going to find that the twelfth name, the name on that twelfth stone, is the Apostle Paul's. But whatever we're going to see, listen, we're not going to get to heaven and see this last pillar over there, you know, with all these, you know, s- scratched out things on it. Yeah, it's not like God's up there in heaven and he's like, Judas, oh, dope, scratch that out. Matthias, dope, oh, scratch that out. Oh, yeah, Paul, Paul, yeah, that's what I meant, Paul. Now, listen, the, the Bible tells us God is all-knowing, not almost-knowing. He knew from the very, very beginning. But we're going to get there and we see that these gates have the names inscribed upon them of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we see that the foundation stones have the names engraved upon them of the 12 apostles of Jesus. And why is that, by the way? Why? Well, because this reminds us, really, when you think about it, that this is ultimately the foundation of our faith, the foundation of Christianity. Listen, I don't know if you know this, but did you know our Savior is Jewish? Did you know our our scriptures are Jewish? Did you know the 12 apostles were Jewish? And so this reminds us that the two major bedrocks of our faith are the nation of Israel and the 12 apostles, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so we have these living memorials throughout all eternity that remind us of where we came from as we enter into those gates and as we go in and out of this city with gates that are always open and never closed. Now with that, John now goes on to give us the measurements, the dimensions of not not really heaven, but of the new Jerusalem. Now as we continue in verse 15, John says, And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. Now, you heard of the golden rule? Well, this was the golden ruler. He literally has a golden measuring rod, and he's measuring the new Jerusalem. And so verse 16 says, that The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And, it is me- and, and, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 140 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. And the construction of the wall was of of jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. Verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The, The first foundation was jasper, the second, sapphire, the third, chalcedony, the fourth, emerald, the fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, sardius, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, and the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysophase, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amethyst. Now, this is quite a city, the jeweled city. And yet, as you read it, it, it's, it's just one massive cube, right? I mean, it's a cube city. I mean, as we said last time, it's, you know, just think the Borg from Star Trek. <laughs> just this massive cube. How big was it? Well, uh, verse, verse 16 tells us that it was 12,000 furlongs. Hope that clears it up. <laughs> now, what is a furlong? Well, a furlong was, it was basically 660 feet. So when you do the math, this is telling us that this city was 1,500 miles in length, 1,500 miles in width, and 1,500 miles in height. 1,500 cubed miles. Now, how big would that be? Well, think about it like this. One writer illustrates that if you took that and laid it over the United States of America, it would cover a distance from Canada down to Mexico, all the way from Los Angeles to St. Louis, 
or another way to look at it, from Denver all the way to the East Coast, the Atlantic Ocean. And that's just the foundation. That's just the first floor. As Randy Alcorn in his book about heaven puts it, he says, you never have to worry about heaven being overcrowded. He says, the ground level of the city is nearly 2 million square miles. That's 40 times larger than London, 10 times as big as France or Germany, and far larger than India. But you have to remember, that's just the ground floor. It's just the foundation. Listen, that is just the new Jerusalem. I mean, as we saw last week, there's also going to be a new earth, and there's going to be a new heaven. Because now, speaking of the New Jerusalem, John now is describing for us, and he says there's, there's these walls, and, and they're this big, and, and there's this city, and it's this big. And he says the walls and the, and the foundations of the city, they're made with, with, with pure jasper. And we're like, great, what is it? Jasper. Does he have a brother named Casper? <laughs> says it was clear. See, I made that up. That's how you know a bad joke when you hear one. What is Jasper? Well, it's interesting because verse 11 says it was clear like crystal. And because in the original, the word crystal here is, is the Greek ISP, which means really a, a transparent stone. Most Bible scholars and most Bible commentators agree that, that this is describing a perfectly clear diamond, a diamond with absolute clarity, no imperfections a perfectly clear diamond. And so the, the very foundations of, of, of the city is made up of, of, of pure diamond. And then, and then, and then the foundations are, are decorated with emeralds and with rubies and with sapphires and all these other precious stones. And then the streets of the city are pure gold. And, and keep in mind, back in verse 9, we saw that this was the bridal city. Back in verse 9, he says, I'll show you the bride. This is the bridal city. Hey, ladies, do you know what this is saying? It's saying, he went to Jared. <laughs> now, think about this. Here's something to think about. You know, speaking of diamonds, uh, there's a diamond called the Heart of Eternity. This is a diamond that's worth some $16 million. Then, of course, there's the famous Hope Diamond that's worth over $350 million. But then the most expensive diamond in all the world is a diamond called the Kenora Diamond, which means Mountain of Light in Persian. And this is a diamond that is absolutely priceless. It's beyond estimation. And yet at the same time, the foundation of heaven, the walls of heaven, are a pure, clear without any blemish, diamond. It's a radiant city. Now, with that, verse 21 goes on to tell us that the gates of the city, the gates that lead into the city, are, 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 are solid pearl. And in fact, it tells us that it's one big pearl. Now, listen, that's one mother of all oysters, right? <laughs> like I tell you, my, my kids love the way I say oyster. Uh, must have been my brief visit to the East Coast. Uh, oyster in moisture. But this, you know, one big pearl. Because these gates were told, uh, it, it says that they were 140 cubits. Now, when you measure that out, that, that's over 2,590 feet. That's a big pearl. Uh, that, that, that provides the gates of the city. And so there really are pearly gates. There really are streets of gold. Now, listen, sometimes we hear there's mansions in heaven too, right? You know, Jesus said in, in John chapter 14, he says, you know, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I hate to bum you out, but did you know that the word mansion there is better translated apartment? <laughs> of the one bedroom variety, I don't know, but, <laughs> but you know, there, there really are streets of gold, you know, and we hear about this all the time in these, in these, in these jokes, right? Like, did you hear about the pastor and the taxi cab driver who both died at the same time? They show up at the pearly gates together, and of course, they get there, and Peter's there to greet them, and he shows them to their new home, their eternal dwelling place. So he takes the cab driver to his place, and, and it's this big, beautiful mansion. I mean, just this spatial palace in heaven. 
Well, the pastor sees that, and he thought, man, if that guy gets this, I mean, I can't wait to see what I'm going to get. So then, you know, Peter takes him to his place, which is just a beat-up, run-down, dirty little old shack. He's like, wait a minute. He says, you know, hey, I preached the gospel, and I was faithful, and I pastored a church, and, you know, and, and, and why do I get this shack? But this guy over here, all he did was drive. Why does he get a big, beautiful mansion? Peter turns and says, well, it seems that when you preached, people slept. But when he drove, they were praying. <laughs> what we have here is a description, not just of eternity, not just of heaven, but specifically of the new Jerusalem, as we pick it up again in verse 22. As now John says, but I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who were saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates shall not shut by day, uh, at all by day, and there is no night there. Verse 26, and they shall bring glory and honor and, uh, of the nations into it. But there shall by, by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes abominations or lies, but only those who were written in the Lamb's book of life. So this is the new Jerusalem. Now, you know, uh, there, there's two cities that are mentioned more than any other city in all of the Bible. Those two cities are Jerusalem and Brighton, Colorado. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? No, not Brighton, uh, Jerusalem and Babylon. Now, Babylon uh, effectively was the city of man, whereas Jerusalem was really the city of God. And yet here's something that's interesting. The, 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 the earthly city of Jerusalem is a city that throughout history has, has seen over 36 major wars, which is ironic when you think about it, because the name Jerusalem, the Hebrew, Yerushalem, is really a word that means the city of peace. And so the so-called city of peace is a city that has been destroyed completely to the ground 17 different times and has been rebuilt from the ground up 18 different times. And yet here in this passage, we see that a day is coming when it's not just going to be rebuilt, it's going to be reborn. This is the new Jerusalem the new Jerusalem. And yet in verse 22, John says that in the new Jerusalem, there's no temple in it. Now, this is interesting. I mean, think about this. I mean, here you have all these believers throughout all time in history, throughout every generation. I mean, believers who, who worshiped in tents back in the days of Moses, or believers who worshiped in the temple during the day of, of David, or, 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 or who worshiped in synagogues, or who worshiped in churches. But all these believers throughout all generations who have worshiped in all these different places of worship. And now maybe wondering, you know, where are we going to worship? But hey, listen, in heaven, the question is not about where, it's about who. It's not about where we worship, it's about who we worship. Hey, listen, I mean, do you realize that in heaven, there, there's not going to be a bunch of different churches? There's not going to be a bunch of different denominations. You know, there's not going to be, you know, Calvary Chapel, heaven, um, First Presbyterian, you know, New Jerusalem. You know, it's not going to be all these different sections. You know, unlike the guy who, who recently died, I saw this in the paper, uh, the comic section, um, but the guy who died, and, and, and he went to heaven, and of course, Peter's there. He gives him his tour, and, he, and he, he takes him down the streets of gold. He shows him these rooms built with jasper and, and just all these beautiful rooms. And then all of a sudden, Peter turns, and he says, shh, be very, very quiet. Because we all know that Peter was related to Elmer Fudd. <laughs> be what we, what we quiet. He says, you see that room over there? He says, whatever you do, don't make a sound when you're next to that room. I mean, don't make any noise whatsoever. And the guy says, why? What's in that room? He says, well, you see that room? In that room are all the Baptists, and they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> it's a joke. Lighten up. But listen, in heaven, there's not going to be different sections. There's not going to be a Calvary Chapel section. There's not going to be a First Baptist section, a Lutheran section. 
hey, listen, in heaven, there's only going to be one church. There's only going to be one body. I mean, in fact, all of heaven, I mean, everywhere you go, I mean, the entirety of heaven, the whole place is going to be a place of worship. In fact, that's the main activity. It says in verse 26, they bring glory and honor. It's the main activity in heaven. The whole place is going to be a place of worship. But specifically, the new Jerusalem. And so it says in the new Jerusalem, verse 26, they bring glory and honor. Like we Skip Heidzik, the pastor of Calvary Albuquerque, put it when he said, what makes heaven heaven? Well, it's not that the angels are there or that the streets of gold are there. No, what makes heaven heaven is that the God you love is there and you get to see him face to face. That makes heaven heaven. And remember, we we call it the bridal city. Back in verse 9, you know, the, the angel said, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Now listen to this. The city is not the bride. It's who dwells in it. The bride dwells in it. The the city is the home of the bride. The city is identified by she who dwells in it. You know, it's just just like a house. You know, if you drive by my house, you know, you might say, hey, there's the Bhutans. Now, you don't mean that the house itself are the Bhutans. You mean the people who dwell in it. And in the same way, she who dwells in it is what identifies this city. It's the bridal city because the bride dwells in it. You know, now this reminds us, doesn't it, uh, of John 14. We made reference to it earlier. Jesus said in John 14, he said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me, because in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be wherever I am. Again, we talked about this a few weeks ago in in Revelation chapter 19 when we looked at the marriage of the Lamb. And of course, we mentioned at that time that, remember, in those days uh, when a couple was engaged, the, the responsibility of the groom was during the engagement process called betrothal, during that process, his responsibility was to build a place for his bride, to build a bridal home. And so he was to build a place. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He says, I go and build a place for you, prepare a place for you. And this now in Revelation chapter 21 is that place, the bridal city. And and we're given a very detailed description. I mean, in fact, we're even given a very detailed list of the construction materials used to make this place. I mean, we're told that, you know, that its walls and its foundations are are of diamonds. We're told that it's decorated on the the pillars with rubies and with sapphires and with emeralds. And and it has streets of gold and, and gates of pearl. And we're even given the dimensions of this place. Again, verse 16, we're told that it's 1,500 miles cubed. Exact details. Why so much detail? Again, as we mentioned, because the Bible wants us to know that this is a very real place. And listen to this. According to verse 27, for those whose names are found written in the book of life, those who believe in Jesus Christ, those who have been born again, those who in this life have chosen to become Christians, this is your real home prepared by Him, with eternal beginnings, created by God. This is your real home. It's just like what we talked about with Abraham. Abraham longed for a place, right? We saw that place that says he was looking for a city uh, whose foundations were eternal, whose maker was God. Or as it says in the New American Standard, he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And this is interesting. In the Greek, there's two words that are used here. Uh, in, in, the, in the original, the first word is, is technitis. And, and this is the only time in all of the New Testament that this word is ever used. Uh, we, we get the word technical from it, but it's translated correctly here in the New Testament as architect because the word itself means architect or designer. 
But then the next word that's used is demuriagos. And this is a word that, that means master builder or master craftsman or skilled laborer. And so you put it all together, and here's what it's saying to us. Listen to this. Check this out. This is saying that, 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 that God is the chief architect, the, the master designer. He's the architect. He's the mechanical engineer, the plumbing engineer, the electrical engineer, the civil engineer. And not only that, he's the general contractor. And not only that, he's even the, the subcontractor, the skilled laborer. He's the whole package. All rolled into one. You know what this is saying? He didn't have to hire out. I mean, he designed it, he drew up the blueprints, and he built it from the ground up. Kind of wish he'd want to take over another building project that I'm, <laughs> I'm very familiar with. I guess I'm not the only one. In fact, uh, just this last week, I was talking with one of our contractors over there uh, who were finishing up the HVAC, and we were talking about how, you know, things are getting delayed and, and this whole process that we're going through, and he just laughed. He said, you know what? We always say that there's three phases to every construction project. I said, really? What are they? He said, phase number one, enthusiasm. Phase number two, disillusionment. And phase number three, panic. <laughs> we might be in the third phase. Oh, but listen to this. In heaven, there was no panic. When God created the new heavens and he created the new earth and he created the new Jerusalem and, and this jeweled city, there was never any panic. There was only one phase and that was enthusiasm. And we get to participate in it. We get to bask in that glory as we bring him honor and we bring him glory for all eternity. I mean, picture this. I mean, imagine a construction project where you never have to deal with the city. I mean, you never have to file for a permit. You never have to worry about passing ins inspections. You never have to worry about shoddy craftsmanship. But you know what? God, the master builder and the chief architect, has been building such a place for you. Such a place for you. And just as Abraham longed for a home that was eternal, built in the heavens, listen to this, we too have been longing for our heavenly home. And as we said earlier, heaven is being prepared for us, but at the same time, we are being prepared for heaven. What we go through here actually is molding us and shaping us and preparing us for our future there. Again, 2 Corinthians 4.17, this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that's beyond all comparison. Heaven is prepared for you, and you are being prepared for it. I heard of a missionary by the name of Eric Barker, uh, who served as a missionary in Portugal during the days of World War II. Now, things got so bad during that time that he, he sent his wife and his eight children back home to Britain so that they'd be safe. But he, meanwhile, sta stayed behind in Portugal, and he preached the gospel. And so as he was preaching the gospel one Sunday, standing behind the pulpit, one of the elders of the church ran up with a little piece of paper, handed him a note. He read it, he set it down, he looked up and he said, it's been brought to my attention that my family has arrived safely home. And everybody clapped and, and they were so excited. It's just that they didn't know what he meant by home. He didn't mean Britain, he meant heaven. Because as it turns out, the ship that his wife and his eight children were on was hit by a torpedo from a submarine and they all died. And although they didn't make it to Britain, they made it to their real home, their heavenly home, prepared by God from the very beginning. And listen, the, the, the Bible tells us in verse 27 that if your name is found written in the Lamb's book of life, this is your home. In other words, if you are a Christian, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, listen to this, by believing in Jesus now, you're making reservations for eternity forever. And so, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, not one of us in this room deserves to go to heaven. All of us want to. Some of us fear that we won't. But, Lord, you paid a price that you did not deserve to give us what we could not deserve, heaven, our real home. And so, Lord, as this time of the year, as we think about your birth in that manger, 
Lord, we also remember the death on the cross, the price that was paid, not only to bring us into a relationship, not only to forgive us our sins, but to bring us home. You know what? Maybe you're here as we're praying, and maybe you don't know if you're going to go to heaven when you die. Maybe, maybe you go to church, you're a good person, there's a lot of good things about you, but do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? If someone asked you and said, are you born again, could you say yes? If someone asked you, would you go to heaven right here, right now, if you died today, would you be able to say 100% yes? Well, you can, by making sure your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You do that, the Bible says, by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Maybe you've you've backslid. Maybe you've fallen away from the Lord. You've you've turned away and you've gone back to some of those old things. Listen, he loves you. He died for you. And he wants to dwell with you for eternity. Is this you? Do you want to make reservations for eternity? If so, raise your hand and we'll help you do it. If there's anybody in the room, just put your hand up. Bless you anybody else? Lord, for those that that raised their hand, Lord, whether it's for the first time, the second time, the 3,000th time, Lord, as they raise that hand up, Lord, we we pray for them. If that was you, I want you to to pray with me. Forgive me, Lord. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Wash me from, from, from my sin, my failure, my struggle. Come into my life. Change me from the inside out. And put my name in your book. In Jesus' name, amen. What does it say in Luke's gospel, Luke 15, that if one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices? Probably a good idea to stand and sing, isn't it?